Good evening and welcome to Wednesday Night at the Lab. My name is Margaret Mooney. I'm filling in for Tom Zinnen this week. And I have the honor to introduce my colleague and friend, Derek Herndon, who works at the Cooperative Institute for Meteorological Satellite Studies here on campus. Uh, I don't know if you all know this, but NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, has cooperative institutes at about 16 places around the country. Madison is one of them, of course, UW-Madison. And why do we do the satellite studies here? Because this is the satellite capital of the world. And that's a really true thing, and Derek will talk more about that and why he is studying hurricanes from the UW-Madison. Thanks, Derek, for talking tonight. Thanks, Margaret. Um, so yes, I'm Derek Herndon. Uh, I do work at the Cooperative Institute for Meteorological Satellite Studies, which is housed over at the Space Science and Engineering Center. Um, I'm a research assistant there. My specialty is hurricanes, and specifically the uh, analysis of hurricanes using satellite data. Um, how did I come to study hurricanes? Well, when I was about seven years old, I went for a fishing trip in the Keys with my father and my grandfather. It was like one of my favorite things to do. And while we were out fishing, my grandfather pointed to the horizon. He goes, Derek, there's something you've never seen. And it was a water spout coming from a thunderstorm with this black, black cloud and this elephant trunk shape coming down to the water. I had never seen anything like that. And so he explained to me what that was. And I was just totally enthralled. And uh, a few years after that, I started just devouring books on meteorology at the library. Um, by the time I was 11, I had my own weather station was posting forecasts on the refrigerator every day to let the family know what the forecast was going to be. Um, so from that point forward, uh, you know, all, all, even into high school, and I run into my high school friends and they say, wow, Derek, it's, it's so cool that you're doing meteorology because that's all you ever talked about. <laughs> um, and it was. It was really the only thing I wanted to do. So I feel very fortunate to, to be kind of living my passion uh, and studying this work. Um, I got my degree at Florida State. Uh, from there, I went off to uh, Mississippi to work um, at a private uh, institution a business that was developing high-resolution models for, uh, for the Navy. Uh, did some work there for a couple years. And a, a colleague here uh, came down and um, gave me a, a talk about what they do up at Wisconsin. And I'm like, really? They study hurricanes up in Wisconsin? I get that all the time. So every time I say I work at Wisconsin, I study hurricanes, people are like, why are you guys studying hurricanes in Wisconsin? Um, so he convinced me to, to come up there and work at the university, and uh, that was in 2002, and I've been there ever since. Um, I do mention that you know spa the Space Science and Engineering Center is an odd location, but if you think about it, most of the work we do with hurricanes does involve satellite data. A lot of it does, or computer models. So you really don't need to be down in the south or in the tropics to study these things. I'll just mention a, a little bit about the Space Science and Engineering Center. So this was established in 1965 by Vern Sumi, who uh, we consider the pioneer of satellite meteorology. He developed a very cool way to stabilize satellite imagery in a way that wasn't done before. And uh, from that point forward, he uh, founded the Space Science and Engineering Center. We work with other universities uh, globally, so both in the States and in other countries as well. We work with NOAA, with NASA, other government agencies, the military. Um, I do a lot of work with the National Hurricane specifically, but we also have people who work for the storm, with the Storm Prediction Center, which do, primarily they do uh, tornado watches and warnings and tornado forecasting and severe weather forecasting. Uh, in that building, we do a lot of different uh, types of projects, instrument development, so in instruments that are actually going to go on the satellites are developed there. We have a clean room. Uh, a lot of data processing goes on. Uh, we push uh, on the order of about uh, a couple terabytes of data to people every day. A lot of algorithm development, which is what I do specifically. And then we have people who, you know, once you develop all these algorithms, you have to kind of visualize this data in some way. So we have people who work on that. Um, we're known for Makitis and Hydra and uh, SIFT, which is a, a newer algorithm, a newer visualization tool. Uh, lots of training and teaching. So once we develop these tools, we have to go out to the, uh, the various sites and, and uh, tell people how they work. We do work from the tropics, obviously, that's what I do, um, all the way up to the Arctic and Antarctic. Um, we actually have a, a group that in the building that uh, deploys to the Antarctic every year to do work. And within that building, we have a couple of um, smaller groups. So SIMS is the Cooperative Institute where I work. Then we have an Antarctic group. And then, obviously, the um, Atmospheric and Ocean Sciences Department. Um, I'll just put our mission statement up here real quick so you can read it. Uh, again, we're leading development in advanced space-based instrumentation, observing Earth's atmosphere. 
um, conducting research programs to improve our understanding of the atmosphere um, and also the oceans. We don't just study this on the Earth. We actually have people who do planetary meteorology and planetary science as well. Uh, we want to facilitate the transfer of knowledge into the operational world, so transitioning these things into operations is very important. We don't want to leave them just in the research world. Um, supporting campus research initiatives and technical administrative uh, expertise, and then supporting the university's education mission as well. This is the uh, Sims Tropical webpage. So this is a webpage that we maintain. And one thing you'll notice about this page is that it's global. So if there is a tropical cyclone, which is a, a generic term that we use for hurricanes, uh, hurricanes have different names around the world, so the generic term is tropical cyclones. Um, if there's a storm that's occurring anywhere in the world, it'll show up on our page here. You can click on it and look at all kinds of cool imagery. And then there are also some other uh, sites on here if you have like questions about storms. This is a good place to go to, uh, to get answers. And you can always email me directly as well. <coughs> All right, what is a hurricane? Well, they're really just strong low pressure systems. Um, these are low pressure systems that form over the tropical oceans. They only form over the ocean. They tend to not form over land. They can form near land sometimes, but um, if they're near any land, they're gonna struggle. They really need to be over the open ocean. The water needs to be greater than 79 degrees, and that's because the energy as it's coming into the storm is moving towards lower pressure, it's expanding, it would tend to cool, so in order to maintain the heat flux into these storms, the water has to be warm enough. They're made up of thunderstorms that organize in uh, bands around a calm eye if they're at the hurricane stage. So uh, here we have a very classic image. This is Hurricane Maria from last year, 2017, a very um, uh, damaging uh, hurricane. As I mentioned, we have a generic term for these because in parts of the world they call them different things. So in, uh, has anyone ever been to Japan? A couple of people have been to Japan. What do they call them there? Typhoons, Typhoons correct. Um, if you're off the coast of Australia, there are tropical cyclones. If you're in the Indian Ocean, there are cyclones. So just to kind of avoid confusion, we call all of these systems tropical cyclones. The hazards associated with these, obviously, most people think about the high winds. In fact, we rate hurricanes on a wind scale. But they really have other threats. And as we saw last year with Hurricane Harvey, which produced catastrophic flooding in the Houston area, heavy rainfall is definitely a threat. Um, in addition to that, we have storm surge. So the storm surge is kind of a, a mountain of water that the hurricane is pushing ahead of it. And as that mountain kind of hits the shore, the waters will gradually rise up and surge across the shore and do damage to buildings and such. And if it wasn't bad enough, hurricanes actually have tornadoes in them too. So, um, pretty bad. When we think about low pressure systems, they, they really don't exist in distinct character um, you know, identifications. They exist on a spectrum. So at one end of the spectrum, we kind of have these, what we call mid-latitude tropical cyclones, or mid-latitude cyclones. So these are not tropical in nature. They have uh, cold air and warm air. They're divided by frontal systems going into the low pressure system. And they're fairly large. They tend to cover uh, large portions of the United States. Uh, so think about a blizzard or a nor'easter or a storm like that. That would be a mid-latitude cyclone. At the other end of the scale here, we have tropical cyclones or hurricanes. These have no fronts. There are no temperature differences across the storm. If you went and just took a boat, and I don't recommend it, took a boat <laughs> and went across the storm, the temperature would be pretty much the same all the way across. I say don't recommend it because I've done it on a Navy cruiser, and it was not fun. <laughs> it was kind of cool at sometimes, but the core of the storm was not fun. <coughs> and then in between, we get these, we call them hybrid systems, because they don't really fit neatly into these two categories. So these are storms that have characteristics of both of these extremes here. Um, hurricane Sandy would be considered such a storm. Hurricane Sandy was a hurricane, but by the time it made landfall in, uh, on the east coast of the United States, it was no longer tropical in nature. In fact, um, the hurricane warnings were dropped. That created a bit of confusion. So the Hurricane Center um, changed a bit of its policy because of that. So they were trying to be true to the science, the scientific identification of what the storm was, but people really reacted differently to the name hurricane as opposed to just low pressure system. Uh, just to kind of show the comparison of those scales, so here is a mid-latitude low pressure system. Uh, again, a cold front and a warm front going into a broad area of low pressure. 
And that's the size of a hurricane. So this hurricane is off of Florida. We can see that size-wise, they're much smaller. But they're more compact and more powerful. So that energy is concentrated in a much smaller area. And when I say that, um, when we think about the winds of the hurricane, the strongest winds are really just right around the eye. Once you get away from the eye, the winds actually drop off um, exponentially. Just for comparison, that's what a cluster of thunderstorms would look like. So hurricanes are made up of many clusters of thunderstorms rotating around the center. And then if we really zoom down, we could say that's the size of a tornado. Tiny, but still very, very damaging. Um, again, very compact and very small, but um, still damaging nonetheless. The reason I bring this up is that people often confuse size with strength. When they say it's a massive storm, it could have very, very strong winds, but it might be very small and compact. And so the messaging is something we really have to keep working on because we don't want that kind of confusion. Hurricanes have some uh, very particular characteristics. So here are some of the distinguishing features. So I'm showing you a satellite image. This is a visible satellite image. So this is light from the sun that reflects off the cloud. So if you were standing on the satellite in space looking down at the, at the surface of the Earth, this is kind of what you would see. Um, the things we can see here are these, these thunderstorms kind of bubbling up around the center. Uh, we see the very distinctive eye. This is Hurricane Katrina from 2005 at category five stage, so at its max intensity. We get these distinct spiral bands. So these are bands of thunderstorms that are wrapping into the uh, storm. And the interesting thing about these spiral bands, if, you, if you've ever been through a, a storm like this, is that when you're on the outside at the edges here, it's actually a beautiful sunny day many times before a hurricane. But then that first band comes through and the winds rise up, they get very gusty. Um, they might even gust up to uh, you know, 30 miles per hour or so. And then they calm back down again. So as these bands come across, you keep getting these squalls. Now, if the storm is coming right at you, those squalls get stronger and stronger and stronger. The gaps in between them get smaller and smaller and smaller. And then by the time you get to the eye wall, which surrounds the eye, it's just, tor just torrential rain and continuous, uh, very strong winds. The other distinguishing characteristic is the outflow. So as the air comes into the storm, it goes up into the thunderstorms and then it gets exited out at the top. And we can see that represented by very high cirrus clouds that spread out all the way around the hurricane in all directions, if it's a healthy storm. Now this is that same exact storm, but now we're looking in the infrared. So now we're looking at temperatures of the cloud tops. And what that tells us is how tall the clouds are. So the taller the cloud is, the higher it is in the atmosphere, the colder that cloud top is, and the satellite can measure that temperature and then represent it in this image. So we can see that um, all these greens and reds are very, very tall clouds, especially the reds. That's that ring of thunderstorms in the eye wall. But notice that the eye is quite warm, and that's very um, characteristic of a hurricane. If we took a slice through that storm, kind of turned it sideways, this is what it would look like. So we have air coming in uh, at the surface of the ocean. Some of that air gets intercepted and rises in the outer bands, but a lot of it gets pulled into the center and uh, rises up in these towers either side of the eye. Now, as these thunderstorms get stronger, they release energy. They actually release a little bit of thermal energy, and that warms the atmosphere. When we warm the atmosphere in the upper parts of the atmosphere, we lower the surface pressure, so the pressure gets lower. As the pressure gets lower, more air comes in, and it strengthens the thunderstorms. The thunderstorms get stronger, release even more energy, the pressure continues to fall. So you can see that this is a feedback mechanism, a positive feedback mechanism. <coughs> now another distinguishing characteristic here is that some of that air, when it rises to the top of the atmosphere, it hits what we call the tropopause. So you can think about the tropopause as a lid on a pot of boiling water. The boiling water is rising up, but it can't go past the lid, so it kind of spreads out. Some of it will escape the lid itself. In a hurricane, some of that air actually gets pushed into the center and forced to sink. Now, as that air sinks, it gets compressed. And as we compress air, it warms even further, which continues that pressure fall. If we do a cross-section through the storm, we can see that the pressures on the outside are fairly high, and then they fall very rapidly as you approach the center. They bottom out, and then they begin to rise again. The winds uh, will just rise very slowly, and then right when you get into the eye wall, we rise extremely rapidly. And then when you get into the eye, the actual winds can go calm. So I've been in the eyes of hurricanes, and they, they really do indeed go calm. In fact, 
Um, if you're on a ship on the ocean, it's not uncommon if you find yourself in the eye of a hurricane, and this happened to mariners many, many years ago, they would go into the eye and birds would be everywhere inside the eye of the hurricane. Well, they're there because they got pulled into the storm and they're just circling around in the eye where the winds are calm, just trying to stay aloft. So as soon as a ship or anything uh, that they could land on would emerge into the eye, they would just land onto the ship. I don't blame them. <laughs> we can think of a hurricane as a heat engine. So a Carnot engine where we have an energy intake here in the lower portion, what we call the boundary layer of the storm, and then uptake, and we convert that into energy, and then we exhaust that energy at the top of the storm. So very much like an engine. These systems go through stages of the development. They don't just appear out of nowhere, which is good. <laughs> we don't want storms just popping up out of nowhere. Um, they develop as a tropical disturbance, so like a weak area of low pressure. Then they transition to a tropical depression with winds of 25 to 39 miles per hour. Um, if it gets above 39 miles per hour, we call that a tropical storm, and it gets a name. Now, in the Atlantic, we use alternating uh, male and female names now, uh, and we just use the letters of the alphabet starting with A. In 2005, we ran out of letters. <laughs> So we had to go to the Greek alphabet. It was a very, very active year. If the storm continues to intensify, we get up to hurricane intensity, so winds greater than 73 miles per hour. In addition to that, once the hurricane uh, attains that intensity, it can continue to intensify. And so in order to kind of convey the, the magnitude and strength of the storm, Saffir and Simpson developed this uh, hurricane intensity scale, which goes from category 1 to category 5. So from the depression stage, this is what that storm would look like. This is um, a Katrina again. So on the left is the visible image, and on the right is that infrared image that I talked about. As it progresses to tropical storm, we see it becomes more organized. <coughs> Category 1, more organized still. And also notice that it's beginning to expand outward and actually get physically larger in its size. So it's intensifying in its winds, and it's also expanding and getting bigger. And then by Category 5 intensity, we have a monster storm uh, just south of Louisiana here. Uh, again, larger still. Now, the problem with Katrina was that it did expand in size, and it turns out that the larger the hurricane is, the more storm surge it produces. Katrina is not really known for its rainfall um, because it was moving very steadily. It was actually moving fairly rapidly by the time it got up to the Gulf Coast here. So it, it did produce a lot of rain, but it didn't sit in one place. But what it did do is it pushed a lot of seawater onto the coast in the form of storm surge, and that's what um, did the catastrophic flooding in New Orleans. So here's an animation, a uh, satellite image of Hurricane Katrina developing. It'll develop over here on the right to the uh, east of the Bahamas. Doesn't look like much now, just a cluster of unorganized thunderstorms. Uh, it developed from a tropical wave that came across the Atlantic and, and really didn't do anything. It was just kind of moving along, not doing much. And then as soon as it got into the Bahamas, it really began to organize very quickly. Uh, became a tropical storm right about here. Um, continue to organize. Notice one thing that you see here is that it's kind of pulsing and almost breathing. That's a new scientific um, realization that we have, is that these storms kind of have a breathing to them. They pulse in and outward. And we're not really sure what drives that. <laughs> so that's a new area of research that we're working on. Across the coast of Florida there, that, was, um, that part of the forecast was not a great forecast. But the forecast going into Louisiana, the National Hurricane Center absolutely nailed it. Um, three days before the hurricane made landfall on the Gulf Coast, they said anywhere between um, uh, Pensacola and New Orleans was the area that would be landfall, and that's exactly where the storm went. And they also fairly did, a, did a fairly good job on the intensity forecast. Unfortunately, despite the good forecast, a lot of people still died. So here we have the very well-defined eye. Now watch what happens as the hurricane begins to hit land. It begins to lose that eye. The eye kind of fills in. It weakens. So you can very clearly see that once it loses its heat source in the form of the ocean, it weakens very rapidly. OK. We talked about sizes of low pressure systems and how they kind of compare to each other. But it turns out that hurricanes actually vary in size as well. Um, from the extreme, which was our typhoon tip in 1970, or 1970 uh, this is a very massive cyclone. <laughs> Obviously, it wasn't over the United States, but I've placed it over the United States for scale, so you can kind of see how big that was. All the way down to tiny little Cyclone Tracy. So this was a very, very small uh, tropical cyclone. Sorry, tip was 79, Tracy was 1970. You can see the difference in the size of these two storms. And we continued, again, to struggle um, in conveying uh, to the public uh, what that size means. 
Cyclone Tracy, despite its size, was a Category 4 cyclone. Typhoon Tip is the uh, strongest tropical cyclone on record in terms of its pressure. Unfortunately, we don't know what the winds were in Tip because uh, the data wasn't quite as good in the aircraft in those days when they were flying out in the Western Pacific. Okay, a little quiz. Here are two hurricanes. Both of them are near Florida. We have a hurricane here and we have a hurricane there. Um, this one's a smaller hurricane, that one's a bigger hurricane. Which one is stronger? The one on the left, who says the one on the left? Okay, we have a fair number of answers for the left. Who thinks the stronger storm is on the right? Okay, so now, who thinks they're the same intensity? Aha, <laughs> they are the same intensity. Both of these are category four hurricanes that have the same exact winds. Now I'm going to ask you a different question. If I told you that the range of the hurricane force winds extended out that far in these two storms, now tell me which hurricane is going to produce the most damage? The one on the left? No takers. The one on the right? Fairly unanimous. <laughs> and the answer is right. Um, so that category scale that I told you about says nothing about the size. So we um, are playing with some ideas on how to convey that, but it, condensing all this information down into a single number, it turns out, is fairly challenging. Um, so this is Hurricane Charlie um, in 2004 that made landfall in southwest Florida. It did a lot of damage. Um, that is Hurricane Floyd, which moved actually just off the coast of Florida and weakened before it made landfall in the Carolinas. But it was a very broad storm with the winds extending out a very far amount, and it did a fair amount of damage as well. Okay, we'll shift gears a little bit. We're going to talk about where do hurricanes form in the world. So this is a map of all tropical cyclone tracks from 1851 to 2006. And you can see a couple things very clearly here. Um, for one thing, in the Atlantic, we can see they tend to form off of Africa and move up towards um, to the west. They generally move to the west, and then they either make landfall in the Gulf of Mexico area, or they recurve out into the Atlantic. Notice that the East Pacific also has a lot of storms there off of Baja, but notice that those tracks are very constrained in, in terms of their latitudinal extent compared to the Atlantic, so a big difference there. Um, the Western Pacific should stand out like a sore thumb. It turns out that we get more storms in the Western Pacific than we do anywhere in the world. They get an average of 30 to 32 storms per year. A lot. Um, Okinawa, the Philippines, Taiwan, Japan, um, all threats from that and often get hit uh, quite a bit there. We also get a few storms in the Indian Ocean. They tend to incur um, in between the monsoon seasons. And then in the Southern Hemisphere, we also get a fair amount of activity around Australia, Madagascar. All of these areas where these storms are occurring are where the water is warm enough to support them. But the water near the tropics is still quite warm off of South America. Why are there no storms there? Or, well, there is two or one. And that was a very unusual storm, but there's a big gap there. If we zoom in kind of in the Atlantic, we can see those tracks again, starting off the coast of Africa, moving to the west and then recurving. And then again, the uh, area off of the, uh, the coast of Mexico here, a little more constrained. There are more storms in the eastern Pacific than there are in the Atlantic by, by about five. Um, hurricane season runs from June until November, at the end of November. So here we are, June 27th. But notice that at this time of year, we really don't see a lot of activity. Now, we've already had our first storm, and it actually formed in May. <laughs> and you can see at the tails of this distribution that there are some storms that tend to form early in the season. <coughs> it turns out that we think that that might be increasing. We think that storms might be forming earlier in the season and actually going later in the season such that we might have to change the start of the hurricane season from June 1st to May 15th. It's still an open question. We're still looking at that, but um, there is some discussion about that. The big thing on this, this plot that I want to, ta to take away from is the season really doesn't get going until the middle of August. That's when things really crank up. So that area from about the middle of August to the middle of October is the peak of the hurricane season in the Atlantic. I want to talk just real briefly about some of the specific dangers, um, specifically here the wind. And I want you to kind of take home the fact that um, while wind is a big deal at the tropical storm to category one, category two range, we really don't get the bulk of our damage in that area. And that is, is homes in the United States tend to be fairly well uh, manufactured and built. In fact, there are building codes 
in Florida and other places in, that are at risk from hurricanes that specifically say you have to keep the roof attached to the, to the building. We learned during Hurricane Andrew that once you lose the roof, you're going to lose the house. So there are very specific uh, rules in place for that. But notice once we get to Category 3 that the wind damage increases exponentially from Category 3 onward. So this is the uh, dollar damage in millions here uh, in the category scale. And it, actually, you can see that a Category 1 hurricane with winds of 75 miles per hour, and you compare that to a 150 mile per hour storm. So you would think, well, the damage should be double, right? The winds are double. The damage should be double. But it doesn't work that way. The damage is 250 times that of a Category 1. Um, anyone want to venture a guess why? I like to ask questions. <laughs> Uh, momentum of the winds. So yeah, the force of the winds is not linear. That's a good answer. There's another one. It turns out that once you get winds over category three, which is winds of over 115 miles per hour, bad things start happening to buildings, even though if they're well put together. You start ripping off trees. You start ripping off pieces of buildings. That debris then flies with the wind and hits the building next to it, <laughs> and so on, and so on, and so on. So catastrophic damage starts to occur after Category 3 because buildings start to fail, and those failed buildings begin crashing into other buildings. So that's part of the reason as well. Um, and for those who didn't see, that is a 2 by 4 driven through a palm tree. I mentioned that uh, hurricanes do have tornadoes. This was Hurricane Wilma, a tornado off of uh, uh, Key West uh, back in 2005. Uh, if you get a tornado with a hurricane, it tends to be out on the outer edges and the outer spiral bands. Um, that's where the thunderstorms are actually strongest for producing tornadoes. Uh, I also mentioned the flooding threat. Before Harvey occurred, we really kind of had the standard for that area was um, Allison. Now, Allison wasn't even a hurricane. It was only a tropical storm, but it still produced 20 inches of rain in Houston. That doesn't actually sound like much now. <laughs> um, but at the time, it was catastrophic flooding for that area because the Houston area and many metropolitan areas, it's all asphalt and concrete. There's nowhere for that water to go. Um, Hurricane Mitch made landfall in Central America. And in, uh, the, the problem with Mitch was that it was a powerful storm, but it made landfall in a mountainous region. And the mountains simply just aggravate the rainfall situation. In terms of ingredients, what, how do we get a hurricane in the first place? Um, you have to start off with a disturbance. So I kind of mentioned that, that these storms progress to a stage, starting from the disturbance phase. We get about 100 tropical waves that come off the African coast every year, but only about 1 in 10 of those waves develop. Okay? So we have about an average of about 10 storms per year in the Atlantic. Um, you also need a lot of moisture. So we have these thunderstorms, they, they, they thrive on moisture. If the air is too dry, they won't develop. So this is an image actually taken from a G5 um, on a research mission that I was on uh, looking at the genesis of uh, storms in, <coughs> off of Africa. And you can actually see the dust, the brown, dirty dust, as we're looking down towards the ocean. So this is not an environment that's conducive for developing hurricanes. And we were studying this very specifically because we want to understand the microphysics of how dust interacts with the, um, these storms. And I mentioned that we need water more than 79 degrees. Um, this is a product that we did develop at the Cooperative Institute uh, there. This is what we call the Saharan air layer. What this does is it allows us to use satellite data to identify areas where the dry air is dry. So areas where we have oranges and um, reds is dry air, and areas that don't have those colors is fairly moist air. And you can see areas where those oranges and reds exist, there really are no clusters of thunderstorms. If we look at a global view of moisture, we can see a couple distinctive features here. So this is a total precipitable water product. Um, it's an integrated quanti quantity of the amount of water moisture that's in the atmosphere. Um, we can see a very distinctive ribbon along the equator. So we call that the intertropical convergence zone. And it's very common for those thunderstorms to uh, be in that position because we have converging wind flows there. And then oftentimes, we'll get waves that'll come off of that area and develop into tropical cyclones. Notice that the areas um, to the South, South America here are very dry in this area here. The other ingredient we need is um, we have to have favorable upper-level winds. Now, when we talk about tornadoes and severe thunderstorms, we want strong wind shear to get those storms rotating. But the opposite is true with hurricanes. We want the winds to be light in the upper levels. So what we want is this here on the, on the left. We want the thunderstorms to stay vertical. It turns out that the hurricane is more efficient that way. If it gets tilted over by strong upper-level winds, 
then some of the energy gets blown away from the hurricane and um, it doesn't tend to develop further. And if it's a strong storm, if we get wind shear like that, the storm will weaken. So when we talk about wind shear, we're talking about a difference between the winds in the lower part of the atmosphere and the winds in the upper part of the atmosphere. And by that, I mean uh, between about 5,000 feet and up around 30,000, 40,000 feet or so. Um, another, another product we have that we've developed is we can take the satellite image and we can look at a snapshot and then we can take another image a few minutes later and compare those two images and we can actually track features of these clouds as they move. It's cool because when you do that, you can actually create wind flow from that. By looking at where these clouds are moving, we can create wind fields in the upper parts of the atmosphere. So the Hurricane Center uses these products to identify areas that are favorable for hurricane development. When we do get a hurricane, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we often use satellite data to analyze it. And uh, I just show in the uh, electromagnetic spectrum here, and just kind of showing you kind of the areas of imagery that we are most interested in. Primarily, we look at the visible spectrum, the infrared spectrum, and it turns out that we can use microwave um, as well. Microwave is a fairly newish uh, type of satellite imagery that was developed in the late 80s and really came into its own um, in the 1990s and the 2000s. So that's the visible image I've shown you. That's an infrared image of that storm. And then this is a microwave image. And notice that you can identify different features from each one of these images. Okay? So the visible image is really good at looking at the banding and the, the structure around the storm. The infrared tells us how tall the thunderstorms are. But the thing is, is that if you have clouds covering the whole storm, it's very difficult to see what's happening underneath. That's where the microwave comes in. The microwave can actually penetrate those clouds and look at the actual structures of the rain bands and the eye and how big the eye is beneath the clouds. So this is a microwave product that was developed um, at the university. The problem is for the microwave satellites, they only come over, they're polar orbiting satellites, so they only come over every couple of hours. Whereas with geostationary images, we can now get images every, every even 30 seconds now with the new satellite. Um, so having those images from the polar orbiters be sporadic makes identifying the image changes of the storm hard, so we developed this technique to, uh, to look at those images. What I want you to take away from this is that this is Hurricane Ivan, and it's undergoing what we call an eye wall replacement cycle. So the storm starts off with an eye in the center, um, a, a primary eye. I'll let this cycle back. And then it develops another eye around it. That eye encircles the inner eye, and it chokes off the, in, the inner eye, and then it becomes the new eye wall. So this structure change is very important, it turns out, because what this tends to do is it, it weakens the storm temporarily. And it would be good to know when that's going to happen. So we're developing tools to alert the forecasters when this process is going to occur in real time so that they can adjust their forecast accordingly. The other thing with eye wall replacement cycles is that they tend to make the storm larger. So Ivan underwent five of these. <laughs> By the time it got into the Gulf of Mexico, it was a very large storm. Uh, I want to shift to kind of some of the improvements we've made over the last few years. And I'm going to start with uh, some satellite imagery. So this is GO-16, which was just launched. Um, back in uh, late of 2016, became operational in 2017. And uh, it's very cool because it has additional channels on it to allow us to look at different things. And it also has better resolution, both uh, spatially and temporally. And I'm going to show you a quick comparison here of two images side by side, maybe. Go back. So look at these two animations. This is the new satellite, that's the old satellite. A lot more information in this one. <laughs> no idea where YouTube's going to take me, so we'll get rid of that. It doesn't ask. <laughs> so this was, um, I mentioned that we can compute these wind values from the satellite imagery. This is the old satellite that we had, the old, ge old geostationary satellite. And this is the number of wind plots that we were able to produce from that image. With the new satellite, that's the data we get. Now, this data goes into computer models to help us improve our forecasts. Which one do you want? <laughs> do you want that one or do you want that one? I'm going with that one. Um, the downside to this is actually that there's so much information here that the models haven't even caught up really with what to do with this. So that's um, work to be done. Another cool thing that this new satellite has is it has a lightning mapper. So we can actually look at the lightning that's occurring in the storm in real time and animate it. 
Um, interestingly, there's not a light, lot of lightning in the interior of tropical cyclones. So look at this image of Harvey. All the lightning flashes, which are the yellows and oranges, are primarily in those outer bands. And that's because those bands, those thunderstorms that are in the outer bands, actually tend to be more energetic in terms of their upward vertical motion. Now, that's not to say that the storms in the center are weak. They're just not of the type that produce a lot of lightning. Um, I just will mention one more on, the, on this, is that when we she do see shifts in the distribution of the lightning in the storm, that tells us that something is changing with the storm's character. So this is going to be great information, we think, going forward. Okay, so I'm going to shift to forecasting here um, and hurricane predictions. And uh, their challenge, I won't lie, <laughs> I was a forecaster in the Navy for eight years. Um, several of that on a ship where we did typhoon avoidance. Uh, did not have all the tools that we have today. There was no, no internet. There were no very few models at the time. Um, yeah, so it, it turns out that a lot of people think it's really more art than science. But I'm assuring you it's a lot of science. So we'll start with another question here. What's the temperature in Madison right now? Where? <laughs> We'll get to that. <laughs> Last time I checked, I think it was 79. Okay. But the question of where is a very valid question. Is it 75? Is it 81? 74 on the isthmus? Maybe it's 79 at the airport? Where's the official observation for Madison? At the airport. But what if... You're over Lake Mendota. <laughs> it turns out the, the computer models only know about the observation at the airport. They don't know about all this other information necessarily. <coughs> so what I'm trying to, to drive home here is that in terms of our observing, we cannot observe the entire atmosphere, the whole atmosphere at all levels. There's a lot of uncertainty in our observations. But at the end of the day, it's that observation at the airport that's going to go into the model. Why is that important? Um, well, we've made a lot of advancements in hurricane forecasting. A lot of those have come from computer modeling, uh, developing ways to track where the hurricane's going to go. Uh, hurricanes move with the flow of the atmosphere. So think about a leaf. You throw it into a river. The hurricane is like that leaf. It's just going to flow along with the river. Okay? It will modify its environment a little bit, but primarily it's going to go with the flow. So one of the ways that we can address this idea of uncertainty is that we can take um, lots of models. So we have an American model, we have a European model, we have a UK model, we have Australian models, Japanese models. All of these people, um, agencies run models. And then there are models that are run within the United States. All of these models will give a different answer. And it turns out there's a lot of information in that. There's a lot of information in that variance. Um, the other idea we can do is we can say, well, let's take the model that we have. In this case, we'll talk about the American model. And let's run that model many, many times. And try to incorporate that information. So we run the model with a temperature of 79 degrees. We get an answer. We then run the model with say, well, wait, it could be 68 degrees. We get a different answer. So we keep doing this many, many times. And then what that does is it gives us a variety of tracks. So in this case, we have an example of multiple models for um, Tropical Storm Isaac, which is south of uh, Hispaniola. And I'll tell you that that track ends at the five-day range. So this is a five-day forecast. And that's, I'm going to tell you that that's a pretty good looking forecast to me as a forecaster. It's fairly tightly clustered. There is some variance, but it's fairly narrow in terms of the Gulf Coast landfall. So you're fairly confident that this hurricane's probably going to make landfall somewhere up in that area. Then you get cases like this. Um, this was Hurricane Sandy. So as Hurricane Sandy was coming out of the uh, Caribbean Sea, uh, this was some of the model solutions we were getting. And notice that some of those hit the United States. A little concerning. Um, but other models were taking it out to sea. So which one do you pick? <coughs> so this is kind of the, the, uh, the problem that we have. Uh, this is actually a weather forecast for today, um, actually starting from last night. And I'm just taking one particular line in the atmosphere that's of interest. If we step forward 24 hours, it's still pretty tightly clustered. Another 24 hours, another day, Another day, another day, up, oh, starting to get some spread here and uncertainty. If we keep doing this all the way out to the end of the forecast, this is what we get. <laughs> 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 now, 
Now, I'm not telling you this to say, oh my God, you guys have no idea what you're doing. What I'm telling you is that there is a limit to our predictability. Okay? And if we can actually define that to some degree. And we can say, you know what, we're fairly confident in this forecast. Or we can say, you know what, we are not confident in that forecast. Um, this is a case for Joaquin. So it turned out with Hurricane Sandy, I should probably tell you the end result of that. Hurricane Sandy, many of the models were showing the, um, the storm going out to sea. The European model was extremely stubborn in saying that no, it's going to go out to sea and then it's going to hook back and come back to the United States. Now initially we didn't put much faith in that because all the other models were doing something different. But then all the other models started kind of moving toward that direction. And uh, it turned out that the ESMWF, the European model, was right. So that gets us to this forecast, where we have another storm, very similar position to Sandy, very divergent forecast, very much like Sandy. Now we have American models taking it to the coast. This time the European model is going out to sea. Um, so kind of we learn from these results. And the other thing we can do is we can say, look, this, this is an uncertain <coughs> forecast. Okay? And we can convey that to the public. As we step forward in time, you can see that the model started to come around. Now they're moving all out to sea. And uh, eventually the storm actually did stay well away from the United States and was never a threat. Unfortunately, um, when people see this on their Facebook pages, um, they see this. <laughs> and I get this, I get this every year. On my, um, people share this with me every year on my Facebook page. They're like, yeah, this is what you guys are doing. You know? Like, you guys actually were never meant to see any of this. <laughs> this, was, this tended to be within the realm of forecasters. This is the information that we used to make the forecast. It was never really meant to be made public. But the genie's out of the bottle. We can't put it back in, so we're left with, uh, with what we have. And that really gets back to the messaging. Um, we can improve on this if we have enough computer power. And it turns out that every, every advancement we've made in computer power has been matched. In fact, many of you may not know that the very first use of supercomputers was solving the equations for the atmosphere. The equations for the atmosphere could be solved on paper. It took you 36 hours to do a 24-hour forecast, but you would get an answer, okay, 12 hours late. Um, but computers, when, they, when computers were first developed, this was one of the first things we put them to task. Now, we can improve this because we can improve computer power, but there is a, a limit. How much are you willing to give? If you make the computer, um, if you try to get the resolution too small and try to resolve too much detail, it takes so long for the computer to, to get you the answer that the forecast will be late. So, we'll do a little test here. Think about your camera, which has megapixels, and you want to get the next camera, which has more megapixels, more resolution. So your old camera, and I, I actually just had a flip phone not that long ago before I had an iPhone, um, took pictures kind of like that. What is that? A what? What if I give you a little more information? Are you sure it's a dog? Some say it's a dog. Some say it's a monkey. I thought I heard bear. <laughs> what about now? I think we have consensus on dog. It turns out, yes, it is a dog. <coughs> the question is, at what point is it good enough? At what point are you willing to settle for the answer? Because I can get you that um, fairly quickly, but if you want that, you're going to have to wait. Um, so again, we continue to work on advancing computer power to, uh, to improve our computer models. Um, as I mentioned, that. Uh, even though we've been able to increase computer power to resolve this ever-increasing detail of the atmosphere and smaller and smaller scales, one of the things we're finding is that actually the models are starting to show us things that we didn't, didn't know existed. <laughs> it used to be that we understood the physics and then we, did, we wrote the physics down to write the code for the computer models, but now the computer models are so good that they're starting to show us things we've never seen before. And it's starting to guide our research. We're starting to see things that, that are very interesting and we want to investigate by doing observation campaigns. Um, for hurricanes, our focus right now is trying to understand what's going on in the boundary layer. The boundary layer is that lowest portion of the atmosphere. 
and that's the part where the, uh, the winds meet the sea and produce a lot of sea spray. We don't completely understand the role of the sea spray from the ocean and how it energizes hurricanes, but we think we're making good progress on that, but there's still some work to be done. I mentioned this idea of eyewall replacement cycles. These are important changes in the structure of the storm, so we want to continue to investigate that with model simulations. The models actually do a fairly good job of representing those structures. They will show us eyewall replacement cycles that look very, very realistic, but they do it at the wrong time, which isn't super helpful. Um, a lot of these computer models in the past were running at such coarse resolution that we had to make some big assumptions. We call those parameterizations. So we want to kind of peel those away and get away from parameterizations if we can. And really, the, the, the best work that's being done in terms of track forecasting, where hurricanes are going to go, and even intensity forecasting to some degree, is this idea of ensemble forecasts. So I've already showed you ensembles. That's where we run many, many models, or we run the same model many, many times. And what we can do with that data is we can run these models. We can look at where the uncertainty is. And where the uncertainty is the greatest, we can say, well, let's back that up. Where did that uncertainty come from? So if you're over the United States, a lot of the uncertainty exists well, let's, well, we'll, we'll ask a question. So we're over the United States, we launch upper air balloons, we have lots of airports and stuff, but we get a lot of uncertainty because weather moves from west to east, so our uncertainty is where? The west coast. The west coast, but even farther than that. Hawaii. Hawaii. Over the ocean. Over the ocean. We don't have a lot of observations over the ocean. We don't have airports. We don't have balloon launches. There are some aircraft and a few ship observations and buoys, but we have huge gaps. Now, we do have satellite data, as I've shown you, um, but we do still have some gaps in that area. It's all not bad news. We have made a lot of progress. This is the uh, track forecast error from the National Hurricane Center for hurricane forecast tracks um, over the last uh, couple decades. And you can see for the different forecast time frames that those errors have gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, in fact, the five-day forecast is now as accurate as the four-day forecast was like 20 or 30 years ago. And you can actually quantify that. You can say, well, back in 2008, the size of the uncertainty cone was in the blue. The size of that cone dictates how, much pe how many people we have to evacuate. Okay. Um, so this forecast is trying to take into account the uncertainty, and that's why the cone gets larger over time. But that cone has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller, which is great. So we have to, we, we have to evacuate fewer and fewer people. That's good for them because they don't have to evacuate. They can stay home with their families. It's also good for the economy because evacuating all these people costs a lot of money. All these businesses have to shut down. So there's no doubt that there's an economic impact from this that we are able to reduce. However, we're fighting a bit of a battle here. <laughs> For every time that we improve the forecast, more people move to the coast. <laughs> so you can see in this plot here, this is a density plot of the various counties along the areas where hurricanes impact. And you can see some of these counties have had 500% growth in these counties from 1960 to 2008. And I'll tell you that since 2008, that hasn't stopped. Even though hurricanes continue to make landfall, people continue to move towards the coast. So even though we continue to make improvements and track forecasts, because so many people are on the coast and because the roads are still limited in terms of how many people we can move out, it takes longer to get those people out. The advancements that we've made in forecasting where hurricanes are going to go has not been matched by our intensity forecasts. So this is that same plot for that same period that I just showed you for track forecasts, but this is for forecasting intensity. And you can see that it's fairly flat. We haven't made a whole lot of progress. Now, I did actually just see a new plot of this uh, that goes beyond 2010. And actually, it's showing a little bit of improvement. We think that the computer models are now good enough that they're actually able to resolve that inner core of the storm, which is fairly small. And by being able to resolve that inner core of the storm, we're starting to be able to get the intensity forecast a little bit better. But we still have a lot of work to do on this. Um, this is a cumulative percentage distribution showing uh, the forecast errors, um, and so the error in, in knots, so a knot is about a mile per hour, a little bit, little bit um, smaller than a mile per hour, so uh, say 40 knots is about 45 miles per hour. Um, you can see that we just do still get some fairly large errors of 45, 60, and even sometimes almost 90 mile per hour forecast errors. Now, remember what I said that, you know, 
uh, you know, category one hurricane, 75 miles per hour. So there are times when our <laughs> forecasts are off by more than a cat couple categories. That's especially dangerous when the storm is developing near the coast. If the storm is well out to sea, we have plenty of time. Even if it rapidly intensifies and we blow the forecast, we have time to warn the people at the coast. But Hurricane Harvey was not that case. Hurricane Harvey went from a tropical storm to a Category 4 hurricane in, in less than two days. Less than two days. Not a lot of time to get the, uh, the, the word out. Okay, big shift here. We've talked about kind of observations, modeling, forecasting, but I know some of you here are interested in, in the climate aspect of this, so I wanted to add this to the talk. Uh, so I'm going to pose uh, a couple of thoughts here. So if a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? Very, very deep and philosophical. I'll change that around a little bit and I'll say this. If a hurricane moves through the Atlantic and no one observed it, did it exist? The reason I say that is that our hurricane data record is very short when we think about geological timescales. And it really is the best in the satellite era, which is fairly recent. Here are hurricane tracks from 1851. Uh, one thing you'll notice is that most of these tracks are near land. That's not a coincidence. <laughs> I mentioned uh, earlier that we average about 10 storms per year. I count one, two, three, four, five. What was going on out there? <laughs> Who knew? No ships out there, or very few. And it turns out ships don't like hurricanes. <laughs> so if they, they see them, have any indication that they're out there, they're like going the other direction. So they run away, which is a good idea. I'm showing this because um, back in the 2000s and the 1990s, when there was a lot of discussion about global warming, some people said, wow, I wonder what impact this is having on hurricanes. I know. Let's look. Let's see what, if hurricanes are increasing in numbers. Wow, look. From 1880 to the 2000s, they've really, really increased. Well, as I just showed you, we don't actually know a whole lot about hurricanes in this time period. And we probably were missing at least two to three hurricanes per year during then. So trying to draw this conclusion from this data is not a good idea. I can expand that further globally and show you that if you look at the total number of storms around the globe from 1940 until 2010, you can see this kind of cumulative increase. Um, so this includes not just storms in the Atlantic, but the Eastern Pacific, the Western Pacific, Indian Ocean, Southern Hemisphere. Uh, the Joint Typhoon Warning Center um, out in Hawaii does this work. They were previously out in Guam. We have about 80 storms per year. We know that that's a very solid number. It occurs about every year, about 80 storms. Uh, not 10. So we have this very heterogeneous uh, record of data of hurricane um, you know, storms in terms of numbers of storms. So this is a difficult thing to look at when we're trying to look at trend analysis because the satellite record really begins in the 1960s and 1970s. And that's primarily in the Atlantic and the United States area. It took a while for other countries to, to launch their own satellites. So really, our most confident data record exists from about 1979 onward, which is not a very long period. But we could still look at that and say, well, we have pretty good confidence in that data from 1986 until now. What does it look like? So this is a, a climatological scale in terms of climatology. We look at 30-year periods when we talk about climatology. Um, looks like an increase in both uh, hurricanes, but especially it looks like an increase in major hurricanes. That kind of makes sense physically to us. If the atmosphere earth ocean system is indeed warming and the ocean specifically is warming and hurricanes drive, derive their energy from ocean heat if the ocean gets warmer hurricanes should get stronger it kind of makes sense all things being equal um, one way we can fill in the, the gaps in that old hurricane record and some people are working on this are some very novel ideas one guy came up with the idea that, you know what, some of these inland lakes that are close to the coast, what if we like dig down into the sediment and take a look in there and, and look and see if there's any kind of evidence? And it turns out that there is. And what they found is that when the storm surge comes in and pushes all that sand over the, the land and into the water, you get these layers of muck sand, muck 
sand, muck, sand. Each layer of sand represents a storm. And so they can go around the world and look at these core samples and say, there were hurricanes here on these dates, plus or minus. The coolest thing I saw in the last two weeks was this study. Some, some folks in Japan came up with the idea, I have no idea how, <laughs> um, to look at the, the shell growth of this giant clam, Tridacna maxima. <laughs> and it turns out that the, the clam, uh, its shell growth changes with water temperatures. When a hurricane moves over the ocean, it churns that water, churns it up. So there's warm water at the top, but below there, there's a lot of cold water. And when it churns that water, that cold water gets mixed up to the top and it changes the temperature of the water throughout a fairly large depth. The clams respond to that by changing their shell thickness. So they're looking at that. The question often is asked, you know, is, is human activity uh, impacting hurricanes, tropical cyclones in some, some relevant way. Can we even detect those trends? And if so, can we attribute some part of that to human activities? One of the things we want to do is that if we think that that's true and we develop models to look at it, they have to be able to at least reproduce what happened in the past. I mentioned that the hurricane record is, is, has this, these large heterogeneities in it and makes it very difficult to look at these trends especially with respect to intensity, because we didn't even know where storms were back in the record, much less how strong they were. But there is something we can look at that's not sensitive to that. We can look at their maximum intensity through their whole life. Where did they attain that maximum intensity? It doesn't matter how strong they were, because we're just looking at where the peak occurred. And when we look at that, and look at that trend over the satellite record, it appears to us that hurricanes are attaining that intensity at higher and higher latitudes, farther and farther away from the equator. So they're moving north in the <coughs> northern hemisphere and south in the southern hemisphere. Not by a lot, but by a statistically significant amount. If we look at that record and kind of expand it back to uh, 1940, um, again, that part of the record is a little more uncertain, but we can see this trend, and then we can take a, a climate model and run it and see what the trend is in the climate model. And it turned out that the climate model's results look a lot like what's been happening in the past. That uh, tropical cyclones are attaining their maximum intensity farther away from the equator. Another thing that we can look at is, uh, that's also in, fairly insensitive to the uh, hurricane data record, is the rainfall and also how storms are moving, whether they're slowing down or not. And the reason that, we, we th that this was brought up, and uh, Jim Cosson, one of my colleagues who did the previous study and also this one, uh, looked at this and thought, this idea that we're having warming, but the warming is not uniform in the atmosphere. Most of the warming is occurring in the poles. So the, the poles are warming faster than the tropics are. Well, if you think about it, the jet stream is driven by the difference in temperature between the poles and the equator. And if that temperature difference is decreasing, then the jet stream would also be decreasing. And if the jet stream is decreasing and hurricanes move with that flow, they should be slowing down. So it turns out that that's true. Hurricanes, uh, tropical cyclones, do appear to be slowing down. Why is that important? Well, as I mentioned earlier, we have a couple of storms that produce tremendous rainfall. The, the intensity of the storm is not strongly correlated with the amount of rainfall it produces. What is strongly correlated is how fast the storm is moving. A storm that is moving very slowly will produce a lot more rainfall. And it makes sense. If you had a thunderstorm parked over your house all day, it would dump you know, rain all day on you, right? Because it's not moving. Same thing with hurricanes. If they're moving very slowly, they produce a lot of rain. Hurricanes are very, very efficient at converting moisture in the atmosphere into raindrops and producing rainfall. The other thing that happens is that if you warm the environment, you evaporate more moisture into it. So the amount of warming that, warming that we have observed in the atmosphere, we think corresponds to about a 6% increase in the amount of moisture. So some of that moisture certainly has turned into rainfall. Uh, we think that some of that was manifested in the, the catastrophic event that occurred in Houston. So here we have um, the rainfall plot for Houston. We can see a broad area of greater than 40 and 50 inches. And there were, there were peaks in this area of um, more than 60 inches of rainfall. Now, I was just there last week uh, doing some hurricane recovery work in some of these damaged areas, and that area is still very, very damaged. There's still a lot of, a lot of wet drywall being ripped out and houses being repaired in that area. It's going to take them probably at least another year to recover from that storm. 
We can also put this in some historical context and say, well, how, how unusual is a 60-inch rainfall in Houston? Maybe it, maybe it happens a lot. Well, we don't think it happens very much. We think it has a return period of about 1,000 years. <laughs> so not very often there. Um, so it kind of piques our interest. We think, you know, with this idea of slowing storms and increased moisture, how much of a global warming signal is in Hurricane Harvey? It's very difficult to attribute global warming impacts on specific storms, but we have some confidence in here that at least some of the rainfall that occurred in Harvey does have a, a footprint of, of, uh, of the global warming signal in it. Now you might think 6% increase, that's not a big deal, that's not a lot of rain. Well, it could mean the difference between stopping at the top of the dam or going over the top of the dam. So with that, I'll, um, I'll end. I uh, covered a lot of material there, a lot of different areas of hurricanes. I hope um, uh, what you found was interesting, and I think I have some time to take a couple questions. Right here. Can you talk about what role your, um, you and your colleagues had in these new satellites that are so much more effective, and uh, some of the uh, functionality of those that gives us, uh, you know, well, I know the apps on my phone have gotten a lot better. <laughs> okay, so the question is, is, what role does the Space Science and Engineering Center play in the development of the satellites and, and the use of that data? Um, we definitely play a strong role, I would say. Uh, so, some of the instruments during the development phase, uh, we have some input into. Uh, one of the things that we do when we launch a new satellite, we don't want to just slap these instruments on the satellite, throw them up in space and say, oh, give me your data. We want to try and understand what that data is going to look like and what impact it's going to have on the models. So we can do these theoretical uh, studies and, and take the data and actually simulate the data before the satellites ever launch. We can simulate it with models and uh, come up with basically synthetic observations, put that information into the models and see what we get. And that can kind of guide the process as to, well, maybe we should tweak these channels a little bit because it seems like the model is more sensitive to the channel you know, in this particular location. So it can guide the process of developing the instruments that go on there. Um, and then we do a lot, of, a lot of calibration work. So once the satellite is launched and we start to receive the data, we have to understand, well, how good is it? Did the data fall within the specs that we designed? And so we do a lot of that work in terms of validating uh, the data once it's launched. In the back. How does uh, the future of microwave uh, meteorology look in the growing interference of the electromagnetic spectrum? So the question is, what does the uh, microwave meteorology look like in terms of interference with the, um, the spectrum? Uh, when I talk about microwave, uh, it took me a little bit of time to get back to that end. When I talk about microwave, uh, the sensors that I'm talking about are passive sensors. They do not transmit a signal on the satellites anyway. So in terms of the satellite data, there's no interference because they're passive. They're just listening. They're just looking at the upwelled radiation from the surface of the Earth. Yeah, but now, you, can get that, you, you can get interference from ra microwave radiation on the Earth, is what I'm talking that's, about. That's true. I don't think that there's any big sources of <coughs> interference at the frequencies that we're currently looking at. That's not to say that, that some of the sensors that we're launching, and some of them are active sensors that do transmit signals, won't be interfered with in the future. Uh, the one of the, there is one sensor, I think, it operates in the 37 gigahertz range that could have had some uh, issues with, with uh, some of the frequencies that, that are being transmitted. But so far, it hasn't been an issue. <coughs> but obviously, we continue to launch more satellites. I'm part of a, a, a program... Um, where we're going to launch miniature satellites, small satellites. So the idea there being that in the past, we've launched these huge, expensive satellites with lots of things on them. The problem is, is that's a single point of failure, right? If that satellite explodes on launch or doesn't make it into orbit or whatever, you've lost the whole thing. So we're thinking a little bit differently about that and launching smaller satellites. They won't last as long, but they're easier to replace. And so we're going to be launching these satellites. And so other people are doing something similar. So instead of launching one satellite, you launch a dozen. So the polar orbiter satellites, the problem is, is that if you only have one, you get these big gaps um, in time. By launching many satellites, you can reduce those gaps. Other questions? Right here. What are you able to do with data from the satellites to help predict the severity of the storm surge? 
So the question is, what, what do, can we use the satellites to do to help with storm surge predictions? Um, I will show you this. Here, give me a second. Sorry, I've lost it. I'll just bring this one up. This is a microwave image of a storm. Uh, one of the things we can do is the satellite data can tell us how large the storm is. So we run storm surge models. Uh, which, are, which really are a mix of atmospheric forcing, but obviously ocean forcing as well. And in addition to that, the, the, uh, the bathymetry of the ocean is very important and the shape of the coast. Those, those are all factors in storm surge modeling. But one of the things that goes into the storm surge model is how strong is the storm, how large is its eye, and how far out do the winds extend? Satellite data can help answer that question. So the data that initializes those models can come from satellite data. And improving the satellite data would improve those models. And is that being incorporated into the uh, prediction information given to the general public? I'm remembering Ike, which did so much damage mm -hmm. along, right immediately along the coast. Uh, you know, the folks on Bolivar Peninsula didn't have time to get out before the storm because the surge right. had turned the peninsula into an island. Right. Ike was a challenging storm because the storm after it uh, had gone, undergone a number of eyewall replacement cycles, then it crossed some land and weakened a fair amount and went into the Gulf of Mexico. Well, when the storm weakened, people started to drop their guard a little bit. They're like, well, it's category one, category two. Pfft, I've been through much stronger. My great grandma went, to, went through storm blah, 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 <laughs> you know, here. We get that a lot. Uh, we get a lot of storm comparisons like that. But the thing about Ike was that it had expanded outward and was a large storm. And as we've mentioned, that those storms push a lot more storm surge. So part of it's the messaging, getting the information to the public that there's more to the storm information than just its category status. Um, the other thing that we're doing now is that the National Hurricane Center is now issuing specific warnings with respect to storm surge. Storm surge watches and storm surge warnings. And I think that will help as well. Uh, so I think part of it is an observation, modeling, problem, but also it's the messaging that we need to improve. Yes? Uh, you talked about how the hurricanes seem to be slowing down some as, they, as mm -hmm. the weather systems do. I know it's a little off topic, but for the low pressure systems over the continents, which are friendly to them, is there uh, studies that have shown that those are slowing down as well? Yeah, so this is very specific work on, on just hurricanes, but I suspect that you know, again, if the jet stream is weaker and the flow is slower, that we would also see the slowing down of weather systems in general. Now, whether that's going to be manifested in rainfall differences, say, over the Great Plains or Wisconsin, for that matter, I haven't seen any specific work on that um, yet. But it, it might be out there. I'm not saying it's not, but I haven't seen it personally. Yes? You mentioned the effect of the Saharan sand on the Atlantic hurricane. <coughs> I saw that this year there's a tremendous amount of uh, sand there is right now mm -hmm. in the Caribbean. Does that, does, does that generally hold down development? It will. It absolutely will. Um, the sand to some degree, but really the sand is a, a proxy for uh, the dry air. So this is that product that I mentioned earlier. So this is the Saharan air layer product where we look at uh, some channel differencing in combinations to look at where the dry air is. And you can see the Caribbean, very dry. What we call the main development region of the Atlantic is very, very dry. So uh, we really don't expect to see a lot of development in this region right now. But as I showed you in the plot that showed the distribution of wind storms occur, we're not even near the, the hurricane peak. And that's one of the reasons why we don't see a lot of development in the Atlantic, because this tends to suppress development in June and July. By August, this starts to, to mix out and not be as dry, and these tropical waves come off with a lot more energy. The water is also a little warmer, which helps flux moisture um, into the atmosphere and mix out some of this dry air. Uh, so it remains to be seen if there will be an anomalously dry year that would impact the number of storms. Right now, we think we're going to see an average hurricane season, maybe slightly above average. 
Um, I'm hedging a little bit there because one of the things that drives hurricane activity in the Atlantic is El Nino Southern Oscillation. So in the last few years, we've had what's called a La Nina with temperatures that are cooler than normal off of South America. That tends to be more favorable for Atlantic hurricanes. But if we start to move into a, an El Nino phase and we're starting to see the temperatures rising in that area, that could have an impact on the Atlantic hurricane season. And we'll have to see as that, that progresses. What that does is it tends to increase the wind shear. And actually, if you increase the wind shear and you also have dry air, that's really, really bad for hurricanes and we would end up with a very low activity. Um, low activity is good. We don't have as many storms, but 1992, it was a very, very quiet year, <coughs> except for Hurricane Andrew. So it, can, it only takes one. Other questions? Back right there? Uh, why is there more, I think you mentioned there are more hurricanes in the Pacific than the mm -hmm. Atlantic. Is there any reason for that? And why isn't there any like off the South America? Is there any <laughs> reasons for that? Is uh, it yeah. the temperature of the water? Sure. It is the temperature of the water. So the uh, Eastern Pacific hurricane season actually starts earlier. It starts in the middle of May. Um, whereas the Atlantic season starts a few weeks later. Though, as I've mentioned, perhaps we might be moving that a bit. The waters here warm up. The, the waters here stay warm all, all year long um, and off the eastern Pacific. Um, so the eastern Pacific tends to be more active because the water is warmer. Storms get an earlier start. And th that's why we tend to get more. Um, why do we see so few hurricanes so far north in the eastern Pacific compared to the Atlantic? Anybody want to venture a guess? The Gulf Stream is a pretty good guess, a pretty good driver. The Gulf Stream carries warm water from the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico up the East Coast, so that warm water gets farther north. Uh, what are the water temperatures off of California? <coughs> Anybody ever been there? <laughs> My uh, first duty station was Monterey, California. So I'm coming out there, I'm coming from Florida, I'm thinking beaches, sand, water. Walk out to the beach, stick my toe in the water, I'm like, oh my god, it is so cold. <laughs> Uh, the water temperatures off California are in the 50s. What was the temperature we needed for hurricanes? 79, 79 correct. Way off 50. Now, that said, in, during El Nino years, we do see the water warm up and move up the coast a ways. So if you're going to get a hurricane into California, and notice some of those tracks do get there, uh, probably going to happen in a, a strong El Nino year. Now, whether or not the warming temperatures globally that we've seen over a decadal scales changes any of this is, is, um, remains to be seen. Any other questions? Right here. When you talked about the mechanics of a hurricane, it sounded as if you were saying that in the center, air is drawn in and drawn down and compressed, which raises the temperature, it's like rain, and lowers the pressure. Now, how can compressing air lower the pressure? Right, you would think compressing the air would increase the pressure, wouldn't it? Exactly. Very, very good observation. That air doesn't make it all the way to the surface in most cases. It stops a little short. Most of the warming that occurs in a hurricane occurs in the middle and upper portions of the storm. So it doesn't quite, that, that sinking air gets entrained generally into the eye wall of the storm and doesn't make it all the way to the surface. So there is, there is some forcing that, that would tend to try to increase the pressure, but it's vastly compensated by the huge mass of warm air. Um, I can actually show you, I got a plot here, of a satellite that actually can measure that warm air. And this is what it looks like. So this satellite measures temperatures in the atmosphere and it's fairly transparent to clouds and hail and snow and stuff, which is good because it can see through the eye walls of hurricanes. This is what that plot looks like. So the temperature anomaly is, tends to be concentrated in the middle upper portions of the atmosphere. Now, we didn't have a lot of observations from aircraft uh, of this phenomena because most of the aircraft that we fly into hurricanes, and we do fly a lot of aircrafts into hurricanes, especially in the Atlantic, most of them fly into the mid-levels of the atmosphere, down here. They don't observe this part. But uh, we've done a couple of research campaigns where we've fitted old bombers that fly up at 60,000 feet with sensors and flown over these storms and dropped sensors. And we've also uh, started using drones, and I'll see if I have a picture of a drone. I uh, don't have one here. Um, we started using drones that used to be used actually for spying. <laughs> um, and now they're being used for, for 
I, I might say more productive stuff, I don't know. Some of you might disagree, I don't know. Um, but these drones can fly at 60,000 feet, and they can fly over the storm back and forth, back and forth, back and forth for like a day. So when we fly into a storm, we use a lot of fuel. We have people on board. They've got to get home to their families. They don't want to sit out in the storm all day. They can't. Uh, so they have to come back. We go out in the storm. We fly it once or twice. We have to come back, depending on how far away it is. This drone technology, we think, is going to allow us to fly over these storms for longer and gather more data. That data will then go into the computer models and hopefully make the models better. We think it does. We've actually tested that already. Other questions? I think we have time for more. Though I, I, I guess I'll get cut off when I'm cut off. <laughs> OK, yes. In the back? Okay. Uh, you mentioned that uh, some of the storms vary on how the, uh, how the computer model actually works, depending on the group that's doing it. Is there that a substantial difference in the data or the analysis of the data? <sighs> Well, you've touched on a touchy subject there. <laughs> I, I gotta be, can I turn the mic off? I don't want to offend any of my colleagues. <laughs> um, the answer to that is yes. <laughs> both, both are true. Um, so we have these different computer models that are run for various agencies, various countries, uh, different universities and such. These models all have different physics. Well, why did they choose those physics? Some of it's because the, those are the physics that work best for the, the model that they're using or the computer that they're using. Maybe they don't have the computer power to use uh, different physics. Maybe they don't have the computer power to run higher resolution. Uh, or perhaps they're looking at something very particular that they want to look at in terms of the microphysics of the, of the tropical cyclone. Uh, it actually is pretty good for everyone to be running different physics because we don't understand all the physics of hurricanes. We understand a lot, but things that like the molecular scale and the much smaller scales and how those in interact in the storm um, are a bit unknown. So having these different models run with different physics packages is good. To the observations question, uh, yes, the models use observations differently. And the Europeans do it best. They really, really do. We have lagged the Europeans for a number of years, uh, partly because they throw a lot of money at it. We don't throw as much. Uh, they sell their data. We don't. We give it free to everybody. Because uh, we believe you know, in, in being open and providing this data, not hiding it. Uh, and, and by getting the observations and the code out there with more people to work on it, we think we'll make the models better. Now, we're making progress. We're, we're getting there. We're getting close to them. And there are times when we beat the European model. But in general, the European model tends to outperform us. Now, new, a new American model is coming online as we speak. It's in testing mode this year. And we'll see uh, during this hurricane season how it performs and if we, we note any improvements. Uh, one of the big differences with the European model is they do a four-dimensional uh, uh, variational assimilation. So in addition to taking all the observation data, let me back up a little bit. We only launch weather balloons twice a day in the morning and in the evening. The atmosphere doesn't function twice a day. It's functioning all the time. So those, there's huge gaps in between those observations. And there are huge gaps in between the weather observations themselves. We only launch weather balloons at, at a, a variety of locations across the United States. I can show it to you, but well, I won't. Um, we get a lot more data at the surface and a lot less data in the upper air. Now, the, the computer models will take that data and they'll run with it. So say the models uh, get data at 7 o'clock in the morning, they run with it and produce a forecast. Well, we can run them again an hour later, but all we're going to have is surface observations. One of the things the Europeans have done really well with this is they say, those surface observations and some of the satellite data as well, um, hours after the computer model initially ran, that's information. They'll take that information, go back in time, move that information back, by, by progressing it backward to where those observations would have been three hours ago, run the model again. And so they're doing a much better job of assimilating the, the differences in time that these observations are occurring. Okay. Any other questions? In the back there. Why, um, why do some storms go through more IWA replacement cycles? Oh, we don't really know. We think we know. Um, that is an area of open, open research. But we do know that there are environmental conditions that favor that process. 
And the environmental conditions that favor that process are very, very warm water. So not just that 70, 90 degrees, but way up there. So the warmer the water, the more likely that process is to occur. If there's ample moisture around the storm, then the, the bands will form at increasingly large radii um, you know, outside of the storm. And those bands are good candidates for becoming a new eye wall. So if there's very, very warm water, there's a lot of moisture, and the wind shear is favorable, uh, the probability that a storm will undergo an eye wall replacement cycle is high. Now, because we know that, and we have model data that can tell us that, we've actually developed models that predict when that will occur, and we're providing those forecasts to the National Hurricane Center in a testing phase over the last couple of years, and they can look at those products and say, we believe that this hurricane is going to undergo an eye wall replacement cycle in the next 24, 48 hours or something like that, and that can inform them on their forecast as to whether or not they should change the intensity going forward. Yes? What are the one or two most important advancements that you'd like to see happen in the next year or two? Whew, that's a good question. Um, well, we've launched a couple new satellites with some, some good capabilities, but I'll tell you that many of the satellites that are up there are starting to fail. And we're not replacing them at the rate that they're failing. And as I've shown you, satellites are immensely important. Not just you know, uh, you know, looking at the imagery and deriving information from that, but the information that's derived that goes into the models itself. Uh, unfortunately, uh, satellites are expensive. So it's, it's a matter of you know, being able to fund that effort. There's a lot of work being done, as I mentioned, in the ensemble forecasting and improved model uh, physics and also, as the question was asked a little while ago, better use of the observations themselves. We're not using all the observations. Uh, the American model doesn't use all the winds that go into it from the satellite data. Uh, they, they, it rejects a lot of those winds, a lot of that information. Now, there are good reasons for that. If you, if you accept it, then you might blow up the model solution into an unrealistic representation of the atmosphere. So we have to keep working on that. But we need to keep uh, hammering away at using all the information that we have available, which we're not doing right now. So improved use of observations, replace aging satellites. Um, and uh, in terms of hurricanes specifically, uh, we do need to, to really address kind of the elephant in the room, and that's, that's coastal population explosion. Because every time we make progress, more people move to the coast, and they're, they're at risk. So that's, that's a huge problem, specifically for hurricanes. Right here. Last week, uh, some senators wrote a letter to the Inspector General to the National Science Foundation questioning the uh, compilation of data that supports theories of climate change and actually threatening millions of dollars of funding that the NSF distributes. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you haven't mentioned climate change tonight, but you know the warming waters of the Gulf may be a matter of uh, uh, evidence for climate change. Is your funding at risk because of this initiative uh, by these senators? One of them being the guy that brought the snowball into the center to yeah. prove Ein it wasn't. Einhoff, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so for the um, recording, the question is, uh, in terms of global warming, which I did actually mention, uh, I didn't mention, I don't think I mentioned climate change, but I think I did talk about global warming and the warming of the atmosphere, ocean system. Um, and we did even address a little bit of the anthro anthropogenic portion of that. The question is, uh, if certain senators want to decrease funding to NSF, does that impact us directly? Yes, it does. Some of our funding does come through NSF. It does. Yes? So like for SAT or for like data and different tracks, so how much are, are like you in the United States working with like Europeans and like people in Asia and like collaborating together on hurricanes? That's a great question. So what kind of collaboration do we do with other countries in terms of solving the hurricane tropical cyclone problem? And the answer is a lot. Uh, we have a conference every two years uh, through the American Meteorological Society, which is open to, to anybody who wants to attend. Um, and we have large numbers of people who come from international agencies to share their research and their papers, and we share ours with our, them. Um, I have a number of colleagues that I work with in Korea, which is actually at risk of storms, um, in Japan and other places around the country. We work with the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia. So we're always corresponding with these other agencies, sharing ideas, and they're sharing their ideas with us and their data as well, which is really good because, again, as I've mentioned, data is very important. So there is a lot of collaboration that goes on. Could it be better? Of course it could. Of course it could. There are, there are some countries where it's a little more difficult to work with. Um, I won't mention any of those. Uh, 
but we'd like better, better relationships with those countries and, and more collaboration with them. So we're always trying to foster that and, and make that grow and be more effective. Sure. Yeah. Are there any beneficial effects of hurricanes? Huh. Absolutely. Absolutely. So hurricanes, hurricanes, like when we talk about Houston, uh, the rainfall there, that was really bad. But hurricanes are an important source of fresh water. Okay? They really are. Uh, when you think about Florida, which you know is on a peninsula, and much of their water comes from the aquifer, that aquifer gets partly recharged by hurricanes, where the water percolates down into the soil and recharges the aquifer. The reason that's important is that back in the 1950s, Project Storm Fury actually sought to change hurricanes through cloud seeding. And what they thought was we could actually weaken hurricanes and change them. We, we learned, actually, that's probably not a good idea. Hurricanes are part of the balance of the atmosphere. They're huge energy engines, right? If you remove them from the atmosphere, you're going to throw the atmosphere out of balance. Okay? And something bad is probably going to happen elsewhere. So they, we really just need to learn to live with them. And, and just mitigate the dangers and, and just learn to live with the effects by, by strengthening the infrastructure and just keeping <coughs> people away from the coast. Yes? When you mentioned recharging the aquifer, is it possible to create like a man-made mini hurricane? <laughs> <laughs> people have tried. <laughs> uh, we still struggle to just make a cloud, to be honest. <laughs> Ask anybody who tries to, to, to seed clouds in um, uh, you know, drought-parched areas to increase rainfall. It's not so easy to do. And when you think about the scale of a hurricane, it just would be an immense amount of energy to try and, try and reproduce. We're a long, long way from making hurricanes um, at the moment. In the back. I just wanted to mention that on a hopeful note, or I guess a hopeful note, uh, Real estate prices in Florida are starting to reflect where you are in relation to sea level. Right. So the idea there being that, that real estate prices in Florida should reflect the threat that is there. Um, I have many. I have friends and family in Florida, and that's a good thing. But I will say that for those who do live there, uh, the problem has been insurance for them, insurance rates. So you've got all these people living at the coast who take the brunt of the damage, but that increases the rates for everybody. And in fact, after 2005, uh, 2004, Florida got hit by four hurricanes. And then you had 2005, where you had Katrina and Wilma and other hurricanes. And after that the hurricane, the insurance companies were like, we give, we give. <laughs> it's just too much. And it, it just really increased the rates. So that's a real struggle for the people who live there in terms of the cost of the housing itself. Um, spe specifically in the, the danger areas, which they should be more expensive because they have a higher risk, but unfortunately increases the insurance costs for everybody there. Back there. Are, are there telltale signs of um, characteristics of typhoons or hurricanes so that somebody's looking at the data and they can kind of go, oh, it's going to be that kind, or oh, it's going to be this, that varies around the world, globe, like there's particular characteristics in one area and then in another? So, so the thought there is that hurricanes look differently in different parts of the world? Do they? They do look a little differently in parts of the world. And I kind of showed that way, way back. Here. That's typhoon tip, as I showed. Um, it, hurricanes, uh, and we call them typhoons, but we'll just say the tropical cyclones in the Western Pacific tend to be larger, a little bit larger. Uh, the ocean basin there is, is larger than it is in the Atlantic, and there's a, a, a bit more moisture and more energy to work with, so they tend to be a little bit, a little bit larger in size on average. The eastern Pacific, on the other hand, those storms tend to be a bit smaller in size. So there are physical differences in hurricanes that, that are ocean basin sp specific. I'm trying to think if there is anything else <coughs> that would be obvious to me. No, I got nothing. <laughs> Other questions? Right here? I know you mentioned in one of your slides that Hurricane Ivan like, uh, produced like 120 tornadoes. Why is that? Uh, Ivan was a prolific tornado maker because the upper level winds uh, very much favored rotation of the outer bands. Uh, 
and, and tornado, tornado production. When we see tornadoes and hurricanes, they tend to occur on the northeast portion of the storm on average. Uh, that's just because the wind shear, now remember I said wind shear was bad for hurricanes, but hurricanes actually can produce their own bit of wind shear on the outer bands. It doesn't affect the inner core, but it can affect the outer bands. And if there is an ambient flow up there that is a little bit stronger, it can enhance the, the tornado production in, in that part of the, the storm. So there are some storms that are known not for their winds, not for their flooding, but, but for their prolific tornado production. And uh, that was one of those storms. I can go all night. <laughs> Hasn't there been some talk about changing the scale to try and um, better, uh, better uh, reflect the damage that this particular tornado might cause? So the idea is, uh, should we change the hurricane scale? And the answer is probably. But we don't know the best way to do it. One idea is that we could, we could take this idea that size is an important factor, and, and we can use what's called Ike, integrated kinetic energy. So this is the, the amount of, of physical kinetic energy that the storm contains. So storms with a lot of kinetic energy are large storms that are, have strong winds. Storms that are small and weak have low kinetic energy. But translating that into a number that we can give to the public is a bit of a challenge. And so that's, that's the area we're, we're really working on. We want to kind of keep things simple because if we make it too complicated, uh, the message can get lost. So right now the way we're dealing with this is by saying it's, it's only a Category 2, but it's a large Category 2. And then also get very, very specific about the risks. That happened in Hurricane Katrina. The weather forecast office in New Orleans um, and, and also in Mobile, they were very, very smart when Katrina was approaching. It's a Category 5 hurricane. This area had not seen anything like that. Even though many people thought uh, that they had seen a storm that strong in Hurricane Camille many, many years prior in the 1960s. So there were people who experienced Camille and they said, well, I went through Camille. Katrina's, Katrina's nothing because it's going to be a Category 5, but it's going to weaken to a Category 3. Well, Cat Camille was tiny. And, and, and if you thought you went through Camille, you probably didn't. You probably were just on the outer edges. Whereas Katrina was very large. So what they did is they got very specific about the warnings. They said, if you're in your house and the storm surge comes in, and you go to your basement and take an ax. Take an ax with you. Because you're going to be chopping your way out through the roof. So you go to the basement or go to the attic? Or, so the attic, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just gave... I just gave a tornado talk yesterday, so <laughs> please excuse me. Go to the attic. <laughs> go to the attic. And if you go to the attic, take your axe with you because you're going to have to chop your way through the roof to get out to the roof. And, and then God help you because everybody else is going to need to be safe too. Sorry, a little, a little emotional there. Um, <sighs> and people did drown in their attic. They did. They did. Um, the reason I'm emotional is we were watching this happen in real time as, as forecasters and um, I'm just kind of going back to that day you know, and, and watching the, the storm come in and we're all just watching and we're like there are going to be a lot of dead people tomorrow you know and so that, that's kind of why I do what I do <laughs> that's why I do what I do anyway, yes Dries out the invasives because the native plants have been through this so many times. They were back in three days. Uh, cacti on, on St. John, which is where my kids live in the Virgin Islands. A lot of things were already growing back within three days of mm -hmm. the native, whereas the non native stuff was wondering what the hell to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and that's how prairie fire works too. They right. The non native stuff. So, prairie fire is a kind of a cleansing, cleansing process. Right. So, kind of an analogy with hurricanes. Of course, the humans are new. So. <laughs> 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 They're a problem. Let's thank Margaret Moon for.